it has been a long time, but uh, tonight we are going to resume our series in Genesis uh, after taking about a three-month pause to go through our series on church membership. And last time we were in the book of Genesis, we had worked through the Sodom and Gomorrah episode and we had studied the life of Lot. And so we have covered so far in our series of Genesis chapter 1 all the way through chapter 19. And so tonight we're going to pick up where we left off and our main text for tonight will be Genesis chapter 20 all the way through chapter 21 verse 7. And so since it's been a while... Uh, Since we've been in the book of Genesis and since uh, this review is going to be very relevant to what we'll look at in our text tonight, about half the sermon is going to be a review of where we've been. But that's okay because it's been a long time uh, since we've thought about these things. And so uh, by way of introduction, I'd like to begin by stating that as a Christian, I've found that oftentimes the most difficult things in the Christian life are also the things that if engaged in rightly, they bring the greatest blessing and the greatest knowledge of God. And one of these things, one of the most difficult things about the Christian life is the reality that so much of our life is waiting on the Lord. Nobody by nature likes to wait for things, especially if they're things that we long for. From the tiniest child to the most elderly saint, waiting on the Lord is something that's very difficult for us. In fact, waiting is hard even in simple things. I don't know if you're like me. Um, You call speeding driving efficiently um, because it's uh, your expression of your impatience and unwillingness to wait through traffic. I hate waiting. I don't like waiting and driving. I don't like waiting in the grocery line. But God has given me this tremendous spiritual gift. It's not listed in Romans, but it's in some of the earlier manuscripts. And it is the gift of going to King Supers, examining the lines, picking the line I think that's going to be the shortest. And literally like 95% of the time, it's never the shortest. I always pick wrong. And I think, maybe I'm over-spiritualizing, but I think it's God's way of showing me that I need to learn to uh, to wait on the Lord better. And so, waiting on the Lord is a difficult thing. And during times of God's delays, we may not have a midlife crisis over bad traffic, but when we're waiting on God in more significant things, it can impact us in some really negative ways if we grow impatient. Oftentimes, in our impatience of waiting on the Lord, we could get extremely frustrated. We could get very fearful. We begin to doubt. And when these things happen, we start to lose our strength. And I'm not, I'm not talking about physical, just spirit. Just, we just feel drained. And we often become discouraged. I know it's true for me, I'm guessing it's true for you too, that some of our biggest failures in our walk, some of our biggest regrets as believers, they often are manifested during a time in which we refused to wait on the Lord. Whether it's us abandoning callings and positions too quickly or running into opportunities too fast with worldly haste without thinking through Uh, the situation sufficiently or seeking God in prayer, whether it's running into relationships too quickly, uh, whatever the situation is with an unwillingness to wait on God. Oftentimes the unwillingness to wait is at the root of many pangs that Christians have pierced themselves with. Again, much, if you think about it, so much of the Christian life is simply waiting on the Lord. We wait on the Lord's return to come back and renew all things and grant us the consummation of our salvation. We wait on God for the complete eradication of sin in our lives. We wait on God for the full removal of the curse. We wait on God for the final conquering of death. We wait on God to bring the provision that we need. We wait on God for the grace to give us the spiritual breakthroughs that we long for. We wait on God to give us clarity in confusing decisions. We wait on God to work in the lives of our loved ones. We wait on God to see the name of Christ hallowed in all the earth through the preaching of the gospel that He makes effectual by His Spirit. We wait on God to raise 
raise up godly, qualified leaders in our churches. We wait on God to defeat our enemies. We wait on God to deliver us from suffering. We wait on God to comfort us with His presence. And we wait on God to open various doors for us. And it is so often in all of our waiting where we learn so much about God, so much about ourselves, and where we get to know the Lord better. And so while we wait, while we seek, what happens in the waiting is that we become very desperate for God. And many times when we're waiting, we have to face things that we wouldn't even think about if we were not in a period of being forced to wait on God. Sometimes we have to rethink our motives and bring them to God and be purified. Sometimes we have to reconsider our position on things. And sometimes we'll have those positions strengthened by the word of God and other times we will change them. Sometimes while we wait for God, not only do we learn a lot about God, but we learn a lot about ourselves. And for those who genuinely wrestle with God in their waiting, those who bring their anxieties and doubts and fears and confusions and sins to God, they will meet God in their waiting and they will be wonderfully transformed by Him. But when we operate out of fear, when we operate out of living by sight, when we become impatient and we can't wait on God, those are the times where we pierce ourselves with many painful choices that we almost always regret. So tonight as we continue our series in Genesis, we're going to do so by examining the life of Sarah and Abraham in relation to the promise of the birth of Isaac. And as we watch this couple wrestle with the promise, as we watch their journey of waiting to God and failing to wait on God, we can learn much about the cost and painful failure of not waiting on the Lord. And we can also learn a lot about the transforming power of God that He works in us through our waiting and through our failures to wait and through all of the mess. He transforms and matures us through that process. <clears throat> so, since it's been a while... Uh, let's review the life of Abraham and Sarah in relation to the seed promise as a setup for our text tonight. Um, back in Genesis chapter 11, that is the place where we first meet uh, Abraham and Sarah, who at the uh, time are called Abram and Sarai. In chapter 11, verse 30, when we meet Sarai, Genesis eleven thirty tells us just out of nowhere, hey, by the way, Sarai is barren. And as their story unfolds, the barrenness of Sarai becomes critical to the display of God's glory in the life of her and her husband. As we move forward in chapter 12, God begins to make a series of promises to Abraham that will form the substance of the Abrahamic covenant. And one of the key and central components of this covenant is the promise to Abraham that he will father offspring. And this promise was first made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, when Abraham was 75 years old. <clears throat> in the next chapter, chapter 13, verses 15 through 16, God appears to Abraham again. And he tells Abraham that Abraham's offspring, not only is Abraham going to have offspring, but this offspring is going to be as numerable as the dust on the earth. And so God makes these promises to Abraham early on in Abraham's walk with God. And after several years had gone by with no birth of a child, in Genesis 15, we see that Abraham begins to get discouraged. And in Genesis 15, verse 1, God appears to Abraham in a vision and he encourages him and he restates the promise to him that God himself will be the reward of Abraham and that God will be Abraham's shield. And in chapter 15, verse 2, Abraham, after God appears to him, reminds God that, hey, God, I still don't have a child. And Abraham goes so far in his conversation with God, he goes so far as to assume that his heir is going to be his household servant, Eleazar of Damascus. Excuse me, I still got some residue of the cold here, so bear with me. 
<coughs> um, and so, anyways, so here's what here's what's going on, is Abraham has believed that he will have a child. He's believed it for a long time. But something has happened to his faith through the waiting. As the days and years went by of childlessness, Abraham still believed he would have an heir, just as God had said. But again, he began to rethink how that promise might be fleshed out. And by the time we see him talking to God in Genesis 15, Abraham had come to seriously entertain the notion that what God meant through offspring was that rather than having a child from his own body, his servant would become his legal heir. Now, oh, maybe that's what God meant. And waiting on God can do that to us. In the beginning, when we discover some God-centered promise that we lay hold of, we can believe it immediately with joy. But as God makes us wait, over time, what can happen to us is we can start to naturalize the promises of God. We can start to change the promises of God in such a way that the fulfillment of them is something that can happen through our schemes, through the works of our hands. Maybe uh, in relation to evangelism, it could be a good example, is we first get saved. And we go, oh man, the power of the gospel, we get saved and it's awesome. We're like, oh, this is so amazing. How can anybody ever not believe this? And we go out with great zeal and we're preaching the gospel. Man, we expect everybody's going to believe this. And you're so energetic. And then what happens? Over and over and over again. You watch people reject it. And sometimes weeks and months and years go by. And it has been so long since you've seen anybody come to know the Lord. There's a temptation that can hit you at that point. Are you going to change the gospel? Are you going to make it something different? Are you going to make walking with God different than what God says it really is? That's what some people do. Some people alter the gospel. Some people, hey man, did Christ really say we got to give him his life? How about we just make kind of some profession of faith? This is, this is too hard, you know, the standards are. Man, ah, maybe Jesus isn't the only way. Maybe he kind of died for everybody regardless of your faith. And as long as you believe in a God, well, Jesus will still cover that. You can start changing things and compromising truths because you get tired of waiting on God. And I think maybe that's what's starting to take place with Abraham. He's sitting talking to God like, hey, I guess it's going to be Eliezer of Damascus. What's the essence of that? I'm getting old. My wife's getting old. We're not having kids yet. So maybe you meant this promise is going to come to pass in a very natural kind of way. Oh, it's going to be my servant. He's worn down by the waiting. And if we're not careful, the waiting can wear us down too. It can be exhausting to wait on God. For certain things. But do not let it wear you down. As we keep following the journey. It's, it's awesome by the end of the story. Don't let the, it, the very wearisome reality of waiting on God. Don't let that lead you into twisting the promises of God. To make them something that we can achieve. And something that we can scheme and bring into, uh, uh, bring into being by our own strength. So Abraham's wrestling with, with uh, this issue of Eliezer of Damascus. And so God, thankfully, in Genesis 15, 4 and 5, God tells him that a son from his own body is going to be his heir. And he tells Abraham to look at the sky. And he says the descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. And so God is so good and merciful to Abraham here. Right as Abraham started to drift into naturalizing the promise, God steps in. He knew that was going on. God initiated this vision. God's the one who appeared. He came to Abraham right when he needed it to remind him, no, the promise will come from your body. And not only will this child come from your body, it's going to be as numerous as the stars uh, on the sea. And so Abraham, this isn't some hardened doubter. He, he's a man of faith. In verse 6 of Genesis 15, Abraham's like, oh, hallelujah. And it says, Abraham believes God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so we can see God is so good and kind to us in protecting and preserving our faith. 
God knew Abraham was getting discouraged. God knew, he also knew Abraham hadn't entirely lost his faith, but he was beginning to wonder if he misunderstood the promise because it had been so long since he'd say, and he'd seen no fulfillment. So God is a good shepherd in his good and wise time and for the sake of his glory and for the preservation and purification of his servant Abraham's faith, God appears to him and encouraged him and Abraham's faith was strengthened and it was greatly purified through this episode as he freshly believed that he will have an heir from his own body. God worked in Abraham's life this way and he works in our life this way as well. God will let us wrestle. God will let us struggle. But in his perfect timing, God will always show up in the lives of his true saints. And he will work in such a way that our faith is strengthened and that it's purified so that we will continue to believe and continue to persevere in the faith all of our days. Watching what God did to Abraham here in Genesis 15, it reminds me of 1 Peter 1.5. 1 Peter 1.5 encourages the church with the truth that by God's power, by God's power, we're being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. God's power guards our faith. Just like Peter said, Jesus said to Peter, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Divine, sovereign, supernatural power created your faith. Divine, sovereign, supernatural power is protecting your faith. Your faith doesn't ultimately depend on you. Yes, you do make a conscious choice to believe. But behind that conscious choice, through that conscious choice, driving that conscious choice and willful decision you make to believe is the sovereign hand of God and His power who, is, who gave you your faith and who is protecting your faith and strengthening your faith. And that should be a tremendous encouragement to everybody. So as Abraham freshly places his faith and confidence in God's promise in Genesis 15, 6, as we studied chapter 15 a while ago, we saw that this chapter ends with God taking a self-binding oath. And in this self-binding oath, he is the only covenanting party. And this oath that God took, it was an oath that guaranteed that God alone would be the decisive cause in bringing into existence all of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, including the promise of a child for Sarah and Abraham. So Genesis 15 was a great and wonderful moment for Abraham during his life. However, Genesis 15 is not going to be the last time Abraham's going to need his faith strengthened and refined by God. Abraham is going to continue to struggle. Abraham's going to continue to wrestle. Abraham's going to continue to have his issues. And at the same time, the God of Abraham is going to continue to sovereignly reign over his faith. He's going to continue to minister to his failings and God will continue to preserve his servants. When we move into the next chapter, chapter 16, right after having Abraham's wonderful encounter with God in chapter 15, we read about the weariness of Sarah. And Sarah has also become discouraged in her waiting on God. And she's been dis become discouraged about the promise that she will have a child. And much like Abraham did at the beginning of chapter 15, Sarah has grown so weary of her childlessness that she is saying she's so tired of living with the shame and the reproach and the social stigma of not having kids. She's so worn down by the disappointment of not seeing the promise come to pass month by month, week by week for years. She's still not pregnant and she's downcast. He's been worn down so much by this that she suggests that Abraham father a child for her through her servant, Hagar. And again, I don't think this is Sarah not believing at all that a child will come. She believes that. In fact, it's very likely Abraham communicated to her, hey, babe, God appeared today, said a child's coming to me through my body. Praise God. So she's probably excited, but then as it doesn't happen, she's like, oh, well, that must mean he's got to take my servants. 
and father a kid by her. Again, Sarah's naturalizing the promise. So she tells Abraham, take Hagar, my maidservant, and she can have children for me. And so rather than ministering to his wife's struggles, Abraham agrees to do this. And he, uh, through his union with Hagar, he fathers Ishmael. <clears throat> and again, I don't think that this is Sarah saying the promise will never come to pass. I think that through the discouragement of waiting on God, it ate her up. And she, she thought that in order to see the promise come to pass, she had to manipulate the situation by taking matters into her own hands so that the promise will, become to, will be brought to pass on man's terms. And whenever we do this, we end up causing more long-term pain for ourselves than if we had just patiently waited on the Lord. Ishmael and Hagar will become a source of bitter pain and contention for Sarah and Abraham as the story unfolds. This was a, a significant low point in their marriage. But before we're too hard on Sarah and Abraham, we should remember our own failings to wait on God and how through the, the same type of anxiety, the same type of fear, the same type of doubts, the same type of impatience and confusion, we too have given in to foolish things while we grew weary of waiting on the Lord. So that's chapter 16. They're tired of waiting on God and they take things into their own hands. Chapter 17 uh, opens up and the setting for chapter 17 is 13 years after the birth of Ishmael. And it is 24 years after Abraham originally came to know the Lord. And so in chapter 17, God appears to Abraham when he is 99 years old. And, and he has another profound conversation with Abraham about many things, including the promise of seed. And in Genesis 17, verses 4 through 6, God changes Abram's name to Abraham because he will become the father of many nations, which is what the name Abraham means. And so in addition to this name change, it is promised to Abraham that kings are going to descend from him. And at this point in Genesis 17, Abraham is just totally encouraged and he's really excited about what God is telling him. Oh, yeah. And then verse 15 through 21 happens to Abraham. And in verses 15 through 21, God blows Abraham's mind by telling him that in one year, Sarah, his 90 year old wife, she's going to bear him the true covenant son. And in confirmation of this, Sarai's name is changed to Sarah. And Abraham's initial response to this is not, oh God, who, I mean, you can do anything. That, that's not his initial reaction. His initial reaction is he starts laughing. He starts laughing because he can't fathom how this could come to pass when they're so old. And not only does Abraham laugh, but he actually begins to argue with God and he pleads with God to make Ishmael the covenant son. And as God has had to do before, once again, he ministers to Abraham's struggling faith. And he purifies his understanding by telling Abraham that the covenant son will absolutely not be Ishmael. And instead, the promised son will come from his barren wife. And his barren wife, who is 90 years old, is going to give birth to this son in approximately one year. <clears throat> and so for me personally, this is one of my favorite uh, accounts in the book of Genesis because the inclusion of Sarah in the Abrahamic promise here, it shows us that the only way in which the Abrahamic promise could come to pass is if God brings life out of Sarah's dead womb. The promise depends on God. The promise is impossible with man. The promise is sometimes delayed. Oftentimes we have to wait on God to fulfill his promise in his way. But when the promise comes to pass, whatever promise it is, when it comes to pass in the way God intends it, it will always be more glorious than the manipulative scheming of man who tries to take the fulfillment of the promise into his own hands. <clears throat> 
And so by the end of Genesis 17, Abraham has responded to God. He leaves the conversation in faith. He is trusting and confident that Isaac is going to be born. His understanding of the promise has once again been purified. Again, Abraham never said there will be no promised seed. He was hoping it was Ishmael. And God had to change his understanding. No, it's the one who will come into existence by my power, not your scheming. And so Abraham's faith, again, it's strengthened and it's purified. And he leaves chapter 17 waiting on God and hoping in God. And in chapter 18, that's the chapter where God lets Sarah in on the plan. So go ahead and turn to Genesis 18. We're going to actually cover a few verses in 18 before we go to chapter 20. Uh, In this Chapter, God appears to Sarah and lets her know she's part of the covenant plan here. And we uh, first, Sarah first hears about it in verses 10 through 12 of chapter 18. So verse 10, the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham uh, and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed at herself, saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? So here's where Sarah learns that she's going to be the one through whom the covenant son comes into existence. In verse 10, God makes that promise. But in verse 11, we read about the obstacles to that promise. Namely, we read about the fact that Sarah and Abraham are very old and Sarah is past the age of childbearing. And because of the obstacles of verse 11, Sarah struggles to believe the promise and even laughs when she considered it in verse 12. And I want you to make no mistake about it. Sarah is laughing Because she's struggling to believe this. Here's a little side note. Uh, I think it's important for our context. I know the ladies recently in their women's fellowship, they've been reading a book about godly women. And in that book, the author claimed uh, that Sarah was not struggling to believe the promise here. And while there's a lot of good things in the book that the women studied, that claim is not one of them. Sarah is really wrestling with doubts here. And we know that this is true because of how God reacts to to her. If she's not struggling to believe, how do you possibly make sense of God's response? And here's the response, verse 13 and 14. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah shall have a son. So if Sarah's not struggling with doubts here, why would God ask, why is she laughing? And then follow up his question by reminding everyone nothing's too hard for the Lord. I mean, that response doesn't even make sense if if she's not struggling to believe this. So furthermore, if Sarah's not doubting, then why would she lie about laughing in verse 15? Let's read it. Verse 15. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. And so Sarah is, Sarah is struggling to believe this here. There's no question about it. And if we want to do the text justice, if we want to have a faithful understanding of the struggles of real believers, we do ourselves no favors by trying to deny the failures of God's people in the scriptures. Instead, it is very encouraging to real saints to know how human and how flawed at times God's real people can be. Here's this promise being given to Sarah, and she's having a hard time believing it. Just like Abraham laughed because he was struggling to believe the promise was going to be fulfilled in the way that God said, so also Sarah is having the same struggle. But by the end of this episode, not only does Sarah believe the seed promise would come from Abraham, but also she believes that she herself will in fact have the child. God ministers to her too. And I'll prove that claim at the end of the sermon uh, by looking at another text. But for now, I want to just state, this is encouraging, guys. Her real, genuine, saving faith 
It was born and grown and preserved and purified in a context where she wrestled with doubts and had a hard time believing certain aspects of the promise. And so if we deny these things, we keep some very edifying food away from real saints who have had embarrassing seasons where they fail and where they've wrestled with doubts. And for the sake of the faithfulness to the word of God, and for the sake of a faithful representation of our patient God, and for the sake of the example of real faith that has real seasons of strugglings and wrestlings, let us not deny the failures of God's real people that we see in Scripture. After this conversation involving Sarah, Genesis, the rest of Genesis 18 is Abraham interceding in relation to Sodom and Gomorrah. Chapter 19 is a Sodom and Gomorrah story, which we've already covered. But when we move now ahead to chapter 20, we resume the story that, that is very offspring centered. So go ahead and turn to Genesis 20. Uh, again, as this chapter begins, I want to remind you, it begins on the heels of the remarkable judgment of God against Sodom and Gomorrah. And it, it begins on the heels of the effective intercession of Abraham, wherein he pleaded with God to not allow the righteous to perish with the wicked. You remember in, Ex, uh, in Genesis 19, God saved Abraham's nephew Lot through Abraham's intercession. And again, Genesis 19 is a high point in Abraham's life. And But unfortunately, as has been the pattern in Genesis, after a great high point in Abraham's life in Genesis 19, the victory there is going to be followed up by another failure. And that's what we see in chapter 20. So let's go ahead and uh, begin chapter 20. We'll start with the first two verses. <clears throat> From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now here we read Abraham journeys to Gerar. And just as he had done in Egypt, Abraham puts his wife at risk because he fears for his own life. There is no account of him seeking God here. He's not hoping in God's promise to curse the enemies of Abraham, which is a promise he had from Genesis 12, 3. He has seemingly forgotten that God is his shield from Genesis 15, 1. And instead, he is once again lying about Sarah and putting her in harm's way, just as he did in Egypt. But I think this story is even worse than Egypt. Because unlike the episode in Egypt found in chapter 12, uh, which took place at the beginning of Abraham's journey of faith, Abraham has been walking with God for about 25 years at the time he does this. Furthermore, in saying Sarah was his sister, Abimelech took Sarah for his wife. And now the seed promise has been jeopardized by Abraham's lies. Remember, God just told Abraham in Genesis 18, he told Abraham and Sarah that he would cause Sarah to give birth to Isaac within a year. But now she's been taken as a wife by Abimelech. And so the seed promise is in jeopardy through Abraham's failures. In my opinion, this is Abraham's worst moment. Abraham had walked with God through so much at this point. He had such a greater understanding of the promises at this point in his life than he did in chapter 12. And so therefore, his culpability is much more heightened here in chapter 20. I mean, he just saw God wipe out two cities. And now here he is afraid that God won't be there for him to protect him against Abimelech. This is a big Failure on Abraham's part. However, even though Abraham's failure is even more grievous at this point than it was at chapter 12, or I think even in the episode of Hagar, nevertheless, God, who is zealous for his glory and the fulfilling of his promise, he will intervene. He will make sure that his purposes will be accomplished despite the failings of his people. Why? Because God has covenanted by a self-binding oath in Genesis 15 to bring the Abrahamic promise to pass. And God is not going to let anybody stop that. And so God steps into the story in verse 3. Let's read. 
But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Behold, you're a dead man because of the woman who you've taken, for she is a man's wife. Bang! That's pretty bold, pretty clear, pretty blunt, pretty scary. Abimelech, in response to this, is terrified. And so he defends himself with the content of verses 4 and 5. Let's read it. And now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother? In the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I've done this. And so this part of the story is extremely important. Here we have Abimelech's own testimony that he had not yet had sexual relations with Sarah. And this is crucial because again, the seed promise is at stake here. And so God had promised Isaac will be fathered by Abraham and Sarah will give birth to him. And so Abimelech's defense here as to why he should be spared is that he has not touched Sarah. And if Abimelech had, then the seed promise would be compromised. And in verses 6 and 7, we're going to see that God himself will now bear witness to the fact that Abimelech had indeed not touched Sarah. Look at verses 6 and 7. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I didn't let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you don't return her, know that you will surely die, you and all who are yours. So God tells us that through whatever natural circumstances prevented Abimelech and Sarah from consummating their marriage, whatever those circumstances was, the text don't tell us, we know that God is the ultimate cause of Abimelech not having been able to consummate his marriage with Sarah. And the reason for this is because God's promise is on the line here. Therefore, God threatens to kill Abimelech and kill his entire household if he doesn't let Sarah go. Now, what seems crazy in this story is the fact that verse 7 ends with God not only telling Abimelech to return Sarah to Abraham, but also he tells Abimelech to have Abraham pray for him so that he will live. That is really confusing if you think about this story. And if we merely try to understand this from a moral standpoint, it's not going to make any sense to us. Why would God have the one who lied pray for the man who by God's own testimony acted in the integrity of his conscience? Again, if you try to answer the question morally, you're going to have to twist the scripture. The reason for this is because the reason why Abraham has to pray for this guy. It's not because Abraham didn't lie. It's not because Abraham wasn't wrong. It's because of God's covenant purposes. Yes, Abraham lied, but he is still God's prophet. And not only is he still God's prophet, but he is still the man in whom all the nations will be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. So because of these covenant realities, just as Abraham prayed for the deliverance of Lot in Genesis 18, so also Abraham will now intercede for the deliverance of Abimelech according to the covenant purposes of God, not because Abraham didn't do anything wrong in the story. So, being terrified of the living God, Abimelech earnestly seeks out Abraham that he might return Sarah to him. Verses 8 and 10. 8 through 10. Let's read it. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said, Why have you done this? And how have I sinned against you that you brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You've done to me things that not ought to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? So here, Abimelech is outraged. And he demands an answer from Abraham as to why he would act this way towards Abimelech and his people. And Abraham's response, in my opinion, it reveals just how misguided Abraham was in this episode. So let's read it in verse 11. Abraham said, I did it because I thought there's no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. So here Abraham admits that he's scared. He fears for his life. 
Abraham rightly recognizes that these people do not fear God. So instead of hoping in the promise that God will curse his enemies, which is something he'd received from Genesis 12, 3, instead of resting in the promise that God himself had told Abraham God would be his shield in Genesis 15, 1, instead of remembering how he had a great military victory over his enemies in Genesis 14, instead of remembering how God had wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham refused to hope in God. He refused to wait on God. And instead, he took to lying with the truth to bring about his own deliverance. And in so doing, he jeopardized his wife And he jeopardized the seed promise. Abraham's explanation is going to continue in verses 12 through 13. So it says, besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And she has become my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. So here again, here's Abraham explaining himself. And Abraham is lying with the truth to justify himself. Yes, Sarah is really his half-sister, but she's also his wife. What do you think is the most significant relationship here? The fact that she's his wife or the fact that she's his half-sister? Clearly, it's his wife. And so Abraham's playing games with the truth here. And I think it's important to note uh, from this story that when we are like Abraham... And our fear and, and, and our, kind of overtakes us and our anxiety eats us up. And we've refused to wait on God uh, in scary situations. We also can be very prone to twisting things just like Abraham's doing. Whether it's the facts of the situation or the word of God itself, we need to be very careful not to twist things when we're scared. Less like Abraham, our sin harms others and we work against the purposes of God. So Abraham's fear, it got the best of him and it distorted his faith and he was led into game play. Now, regardless of the schemes of Abraham, God intervened, put the, literally put the fear of God into Abimelech and Abimelech returns Sarah to Abraham. Let's read verses 14 through 15. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants, and he gave them to Abraham. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. These verses are important because here not only does he give Abraham his wife back, uh, but just as Pharaoh did in Egypt, Abimelech adds riches to Abraham when he returned his wife. Additionally, Abimelech also tells Abraham that he is free to dwell anywhere in Abimelech's land. Well, Abimelech's land is within the land of Canaan. And so this granting of uh, the ability to dwell in his land, this represents the beginning of another significant development of the covenant as well. Abraham, through this episode, is eventually going to gain his first foothold in the land of Canaan. I love that. Because in this event with, with, with Abimelech, despite all its messiness and all the sins and twists and all the junk and everything that's there, God uses this to grant Abraham a foothold within the promised land. We're going to cover that uh, soon. You can read that at the end of Genesis 21, where he gains a wept. And it's, it's in Abimelech's land. Out of this, they all had its root in this messy situation is what God uses to advance the promise in Abraham's life. I love that. Now, as we continue on in this story, verse 16, from a covenant standpoint, is also very critically important. <clears throat> to Sarah, he said, this is Abimelech talking, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the, sign, in the eyes of all who are with you, and before everyone you are vindicated. So again, the biggest issue with this whole episode is preserving the integrity of the seed promise. Abimelech never touched Sarah. He said that. God said that. And so now as a public sign and a public testimony to that fact, Abimelech has given Abraham a thousand pieces of silver to represent Sarah's innocence and to testify that he hadn't touched her. Who cares? Who cares? 
Why is that significant? Well, it's significant because the seed promise is about to come to pass. And if Abimelech had touched her, who is Isaac's real dad? That could be a legitimate question. And it could make it look as though the promise didn't come to pass. So God has made sure that Abimelech did not touch her. And so as this story ends in chapter 20, it ends by once again highlighting the Abrahamic covenant purposes of God in verse 17 and 18. Let's read them. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and also healed his wife and female slaves so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So here it is. Abraham, the man through whom the nations will be blessed according to God's covenant purposes. Abraham intercedes for Abimelech and for Abimelech's household and God heals them of barrenness, the beginnings of death. And so we see at the end of the chapter through the intercession of the covenant man that the peoples or the nations are enabled to once again have life. And again, the reason for this isn't because Abraham didn't do anything wrong in this story. This prayer and this healing of Abimelech and his household, it happens despite Abraham's failures. And it's unfolding because Abraham is the covenant man in whom the peoples will be blessed. And so, by the end of this chapter, with Sarah delivered back to Abraham, with her innocence attested to by God, and also by Abimelech in a very public way, and with Abraham being granted a foothold in the land, and in Abraham's intercession on behalf of the peoples, God's covenant purposes have been clearly in view during this entire chapter, even though Abraham had failed. Despite all of the mess, God's promise and His covenant purposes are intact. His purposes are moving forward. And the stage is set for a remarkable fulfillment of His promise in the next chapter. So, let's close out with the reading about the birth of Isaac. Genesis 21, verses 1 and 2. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Now these two verses, they really, in my mind, are the foundation and main point of the entire story surrounding Abraham, Sarah, and the promise for a child. The birth of the promised child happened because the Lord said it would. And because the Lord promised that it would. And it happened at the very time that the Lord said it would. It didn't matter that Abraham was an old man. It didn't matter that Sarah was barren. It didn't matter that it had been almost 25 years since the original promise had been made. It didn't matter that there were multiple episodes in the lives of Sarah and Abraham where they had failed and where they had lied and where they had a hard time believing, where they naturalized the promises and even where they sinned. It didn't matter that those things had happened. Despite all of this, God still preserved and purified their faith. And God still saw to it that that the promise would come to pass. And the reason for this is because the promise depends on God and not on man. Egypt couldn't stop this from happening in Genesis 12. Gerar couldn't stop it. The 5 King A army that went after Abraham in chapter 14 couldn't stop it. Hagar and Ishmael couldn't stop it. Sodom and Gomorrah couldn't stop it. And not even Sarah and Abraham could stop the promise of God. Just like we saw in the creation account, though Isaac did not exist, though with man it was impossible for him to be born, nevertheless, by the power of the word of God, Isaac was called into existence. Praise be to God. And Abraham has a beautiful response to Isaac's birth. Let's read about it, beginning in verse... uh, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him whom Sarah bore him Isaac 
And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. So we see he named him. That's a beautiful response. And the reason why this is a beautiful response is because Abraham named his son Isaac, just as God commanded him in Genesis 17, 19. J. Abraham circumcised him on the eighth day, just as God commanded him in Genesis 17, 12. Here at the birth of Isaac, he's not wrestling anymore. Abraham's been sanctified through his journey. And though he's an old man, and though he's had many failings, and though he's had many victories in his life, his life of faith, here he is. He's under the mercy of God. And he's still walking in the obedience of his purified faith. He names him Isaac. And he circumcises him on the eighth day, exactly how he was commanded to do. And Abraham is a hundred years old. He's still walking with God. And now he is seeing, after a long season of waiting on God, the power of God being manifested in a very supernatural and a very glorious way. He did not think it was going to take 25 years for this kid to come when he was first promised Isaac back in Genesis chapter 12. Let's go ahead and uh, turn our attention to Sarah now and look at verses 6 or 7. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So now here we find Sarah <coughs> laughing. That's how we last saw her, right? In Genesis 18, she was laughing. But now there's a difference in her laughter. In Genesis 18, it's the laughter of, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm old. Am I going to have this kid now? Now it's the laughter of joy. Now it's the laughter of praising God. Like, <laughs> oh man, God did it kind of laughter. It's a worship celebratory laughter. And what's ironic about all this, does anybody know what Isaac means? Isaac means he laughs. This whole story is about laughter. Abraham first laughs when God says, hey, Sarah's going to have the baby. And God's like, okay, you're going to name him Isaac, which means he laughs. And then when Sarah's born, and then when Sarah hears about it, she laughs. And now when he's born, it's a different kind of laughter. It's not the laughter of, okay, how's that going to come to pass? It's the laughter of, man, that came to pass. Here's my son. His name is, he laughs. It's a wonderful thing. Sarah has had an interesting journey. Yes, she had a hard time believing the promise in chapter 18. That's true. But here, here she is having this child and now laughing in worship, laughing with delight, laughing with the praise of God. And Sarah in her journey, uh, you know, she, yes, she doubted in chapter 18 and she struggled to believe the promise. Yes, Hagar was her idea, but she also had some other high points. She did move to Abraham with Canaan when they were 75 years old, when he said, uh, hey, babe, uh, God showed up, told us to go to Canaan, uh, told us to follow him uh, this way. And he didn't really say where we're going, but we'll know when we get there. She actually followed that. That's pretty significant. She stuck with Abraham when he was going around lying about her in foreign lands, putting her at risk. She stayed with him. And so Sarah has had an interesting journey of faith. She has had her bad moments. She has had her strong moments. And now here, by faith, she receives power from God to give birth to Isaac because she believed God and considered him faithful who promised that she would have this child. And I want to close out with one last scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 through 12. And as I read this scripture, I want you to keep in mind the journey of faith that Abraham and Sarah have been on as I read Hebrews 11, verse 11 and 12. <clears throat> By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. 
This is the final word on the faith of Sarah from the Holy Spirit. Despite her laughter of how's this going to come to pass, despite Hagar, despite her struggles, Sarah is commended by God, the Holy Spirit, through his word as one who trusted God to be faithful and bring about what he had promised. Now, if all we knew about uh, Sarah from the Bible was what we saw in this verse, we might think her life was a picture of near perfect trust in God. However, because God in his wisdom preserved her journey of faith for us, we can see that the faith that God, the Holy Spirit commends is real, that it didn't happen in a person who was without flaws and who was out without struggles and who was without failures at times. Yes, Sarah struggled, but she never settled her mind in unbelief in a sense where she says the promise is not coming to pass, God. She might have sought to bring it to pass through Hagar. She might have not been able to understand how it's not Ishmael. It's really, it's going to be Isaac. She might have wrestled with that. But she never was at a place where she didn't believe a promise was going to come to pass. She just was confused about it sometimes. And by the time she ends her journey, she has faith that God is able to do what He promised. She laughs in the beginning, but the Word tells us here, by faith in God's promise, she was able to conceive. It says right here, she eventually had faith she was going to do this. Here, let me read it again. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered Him faithful who had promised. I love this. Because when we read about Sarah, when she first heard this promise, she's like, oh, right on, God, praise God. Can't wait. Is that how she reacted when she first heard it? No. <laughs> she did it. She was wrestling. She was struggling. It was hard. But guess what? She landed on faith. And what does the Word of God have to say about it? That's real faith. That, that, that's got to encourage you. That is so much better than trying to twist up the story in chapter 18 and make it sound like she was doing something other than what she was doing. Real faith, saving faith, it's not without our flaws. It's not without our struggles. It's not without times where we wrestle. It's not without times where we need, our adjust, we need to have our understanding of things adjusted a bit. That should be a great encouragement to you. And the result of Sarah's faith, along with Abraham's, is according to Hebrews eleven twelve, is that from the one man Abraham, whom the text says was his body was as good as dead, meaning he's too old to have kids, from that one man, innumerable descendants came through Isaac, as numerous as the sands on the seashore, a la Genesis fifteen, as numerous as the stars in the sky, a la Genesis seventeen. And this all happened for a couple who watched Sarah have a baby in her 90s. And so together as husband and wife, Abraham and Sarah, they've lived quite a journey. They have failed together. They have conquered together. They have believed together. They have grown together. And they saw the power of God together as they both learned how to wait on him. So in closing, what I want to encourage you with is to just show you that for the, for the times that your faith has weakened, for the times you can look on your life and see where you failed to wait on God, for the times you've taken things foolishly into your own hands, for the times that you've acted out of fear, for the times that you've twisted the word of God or lied with the truth, listen, there's nothing you can do about it now. You can't go back and change those things. And so if you let those things cripple you and chain you, you're going to be completely useless in the kingdom of God and your misery will be constant. But if you just confess these things to God, learn from your sins, learn from your failures, learn from your mistakes, look anew to him. Let God keep renewing you and keep refining you. You'll find that you will grow and mature just like Sarah and Abraham did. And these things are true even if you've had big blunders after walking with the Lord for decades. I mean, Abraham walked with the Lord for 25 years when the Abimelech episode happened. 
Listen, we have a redeeming God and he is active and he is always preserving and strengthening and purifying and refining our faith according to his power. So take these things and just learn from them. These things, these things in your life and and grow and learn to trust in the Lord. Learn to slow yourself down. Sometimes we attempted to just react out of anger or fear or anxiety or doubt. Just learn how to follow God and let your failure to wait on God and trust in Him turn into a testimony of how God can grow you and how He has taught you and how He has changed you and how you learn to be content in Him and hope in Him and trust in Him while you wait on Him. And so whatever it is that you're facing... I would exhort you to do nothing out of fear, nothing out of unbelief, and nothing out of impatience. Instead, whatever the thing is you're wrestling with, learn His promises about those things. And then by faith, stand on those things, even when it seems impossible with man for them to come to pass. And so... I don't have time for time's sake to go through like a hundred different things you might be struggling with and say, well, here's a promise about that and what it might look like to wait on God. But if you want to talk after the service, I would love to talk with any of you about maybe a specific thing and what this might look like. Uh, But for now, I just say just in general, do not take matters into your own hands and, uh, and do not seek to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise in a natural-minded way that's driven by fear, driven by doubt, driven by impatience. That is always going to harm you. And also, one of the final encouragement I give you is, don't, also, I know it's hard, and I'm talking to myself here too, which is, don't despise waiting on God. Listen, sometimes waiting on God's exhausting, Right? I mean, it does that for me sometimes. It's just, oh, man, again, or still, or oh. it's just, sometimes the weight just makes me personally so drained. God's given us a promise about this. Isaiah 40, verse 31. They who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary and they will walk and not faint. And so waiting on God by faith and confidence in Him and with a contentment in Him and a trust in His purposes, that's going to be the strength that you need to wait on Him well. Waiting on God the same way a two-year-old waits to get out of time out is um, going to wear you out. So wait on God, trust in God, and you have a promise, man, just, just, just trust Him. It's okay to wait. He'll renew your strength. And when we wait on God with faith, when we wait on Him with great trust and hope in Him, the Scripture testifies that it brings us joy when we wait on Him rightly. Psalm 33 says this. Uh, let me read it to you. Psalm 33, uh, um, verses 20 through 22. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. And our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. So as you wait on the Lord, wait on Him, believing He's your shield, believing He is your help, believing He is the one who is your life and your great reward. And as you wait on Him that way, that will bring a renewal of your strength. That will bring rejoicing in the Lord. So let's just not grow weary of waiting on Him and hoping in Him. God is good. He will move in His time. The breakthrough in your walk that you're longing through, keep pressing into Him. He'll give it to you. You want to see God work in, in, in the saints? Keep believing and hoping and knocking and asking in prayer. He will. You want to see the Lord come back? He's going to. Keep waiting. Don't chuck the faith. Whatever the thing is, latch onto the promises, keep waiting, and let God be God. So... Does anybody uh, have any uh, questions or comments? We'll close with that. Okay.
But if you want to talk about a specific situation and how this would apply, I'd be glad to talk after the service. So let's pray. Lord, we thank You for the journey of faith that You have preserved in the Scriptures of Abraham and Sarah. Lord, we thank You for not photoshopping it, Lord, for showing us times when they made bad decisions, times when they uh, acted in fear, times when they didn't trust You, times when they took things into their own hands. We thank You for that, God, because we've done the same things. And we thank You also for the story of how Your sovereign grace preserved their faith, how it protected their faith, how it matured and sharpened and refined their understanding of Your promises, how it grew them and made them those who hope in You and wait on You so much so that Abraham will without hesitation offer up Isaac when you ask him to near the end of his life. God, we rejoice in this stuff. We, we are encouraged by this. We find hope for our own walk that though we have struggles and things are hard for us, that you'll bear with us, that you'll keep growing us, that you'll keep sanctifying us and maturing us and helping us. God, we thank you for this. And I pray for us, Lord, in whatever situations we're struggling with, God, I, help you would help us, I, I pray you would help us to have a right understanding of your word and promises about these things and that we would know how to hope in you and wait on you rightly and that you would get great glory in our life. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.